In this video, we will see that Babylon the Great was first covenant, first century Jerusalem. We will look at four connections that establish this. Uh, the first we could make is that in chapter 11, it clearly identifies Jerusalem as the great city, which is also what Babylon is over and over again called in chapters 17 and 18 and in a few other chapters. Okay, so that's the first point is that chapter 11 identifies it as the great city, Jerusalem as the great city. That's also what Babylon the Great is called, the great city. Uh, the second connection will be in chapter 18, verse 20, where it says that Babylon the Great is responsible for doing uh, harm to the apostles. And so it has to be a city that was around uh, and able to do damage to the apostles. And uh, so that is uh, only, well, that could be, that, that eliminates any ideas of like the European Union or the Roman Catholic Church or any modern cities, uh, America or whatever you're going to have. It has to be a city during the time of the apostles for the apostles to be able to be avenged on her. And then uh, the third point was be also from chapter 18, the last verse of the chapter where the Lord said, uh, where it says that in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and all those that were slain upon the earth. So, although that may be speaking um, perhaps in hyperbole or some um, other special usage of, uh, I don't know, um, special way of speaking, but that we'll see that the Lord Jesus uses that exact same kind of phraseology about. Uh, Jerusalem. And then uh, the fourth it, uh, is not as strong but is necessary is just to look and see how Jerusalem fits with the overall context better than any other city um, when uh, evaluated against the backdrop of uh, the book of Revelation could also be expanded more broadly to the re scope of the rest of the New Testament. Okay, so let's jump over to Revelation chapter 11 real quick. We'll start with that verse. So it's talking about, um, so far uh, it has not mentioned Babylon the Great up to, by the time you get to chapter 11, but uh, this, is, this chapter is going to introduce uh, two characters, uh, both the beast uh, for the first time, even though it's, the beast isn't formally introduced to chapter 13. And it's also going to introduce Babylon the Great, even though Babylon the Great isn't formally introduced uh, or fully introduced till chapter 17, although it mentions it a few times before then. Verse 8. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord, or our Lord, some manuscripts have, was crucified. Now there's only one city that can be said to be the city that crucified, that where our Lord was crucified. You can't say Rome. Um, even if you were to say, well, it was the Roman soldiers that killed the Lord Jesus, the who has more blame, even according to the Lord, the Jews had more blame. It was the Jews that were pushing and instigating the Roman authorities to crucify him. And even if it was Roman soldiers they crucified him. They crucified him in the city of Jerusalem. No other city. They did not crucify him in Rome. So where was our Lord crucified? In Jerusalem. Um, and so it says here that it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Um, I guess I can talk about that for just a moment. There's uh, several reasons why Jerusalem would be called Sodom. Uh, in many times in the Old Testament, she's actually explicitly called Sodom, like in I'll just go to my commentators because they'll point these out. Like in um, uh, Isaiah chapter 1. Let's see if they've got that here. Uh, Isaiah 1.10. 
Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And there's several other Old Testament references where, let's see what this Jeremiah one says, where Jerusalem is called Sodom. In the province of Jerusalem also I've seen a horrible thing. Uh, they commit adultery and walk in lies, and they strengthen the hands of evildoers so that none does return from his wickedness. They are all of them become to me as Sodom and its inhabitants as Gomorrah. So Jerusalem in the Old Testament by the prophets is called Sodom. It shouldn't surprise us that the apostles are now going to be calling her by that same name in the book of Revelation, spiritually called Sodom. And uh, why would it be called Egypt? Well, uh, maybe a good answer for that is think about Egypt's origins with uh, the nation of Israel is that they had uh, brought them under wrongly under bondage and were killing the firstborn. Um, and Jerusalem also, uh, with the Pharisees and everything, they were bringing the people under bondage. Uh, the law itself was a um, a yoke that was that the apostles say our fathers could not bear. But on top of that, the Pharisees were adding. Uh, Finding heavy weights grievous to be borne, we're not lifting it so much with their finger, and though they. Um, so anyway, so that's one one way it could. Be. And then also when when they were the apostles would want to preach to the people to preach to them the light yoke of the Lord Jesus, the apostles would. I mean the uh, Pharisees and the religious leaders in Jerusalem would uh, persecute and attack that message. They would even go and persecute it out into foreign cities. But all that persecution was headed up from Jerusalem, just as the apostle, just as Saul, before he became the apostle Paul, was going to foreign cities and bringing them back to Jerusalem to, uh, to execute them. So, or to imprison them. Okay, so, and then another thing to consider about Sodom and Egypt is... Uh, what's similar about Sodom and Egypt uh, is that they both received judgment from God in a miraculous way from heaven. And so it also Jerusalem was about to receive judgment from God in a miraculous way. And with the Lord Jesus prophesied about uh, Jerusalem, how it would be surrounded by armies and laid desolate even to the ground. So all three of these cities were going to receive divine judgment from God uh, as a penalty for their sin and their uh, rebellion against Him. Okay, but what we really want to point out mostly here from this verse is the fact that their bodies will be in the street of the great city. Okay, and so all the time, uh, as we'll see as we go through the... Let's just um, see if our commentators even picked up on this for the great city. Okay, yeah, look at all these references they give here. Uh, chapter 11, 13. Um, well, it just mentions a tenth of the city. doesn't call it the great city there. Um, chapter 14. Babylon... The great is fallen, and is so they're re recognizing that that is my commentator here, and this is just treasury of scripture knowledge, is seeing the connection there that the great city is Babylon the Great, even though that verse doesn't mention Babylon the Great, at least not in the New Heart English Bible. Um, Revelation sixteen nineteen, the great city was divided into three parts, um, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered in the sight of God. So Babylon the Great is the great city. Chapter 17, verse 1. One of the angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. Well, it doesn't mention great city there, but great prostitute. Verse 5. Um, Babylon the Great, that's not a good example either. Verse uh, eight, chapter 18, verse 2, Fallen, Fallen, is Babylon the Great. Okay, that one doesn't mention Great City. 
Uh, verse, verse 10. Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the strong city. Let's see. Chapter 18, verse 18. And exclaimed as they looked at the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this, the great city? Chapter 18, verse 21. A mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it in the sea, saying, Thus with violence will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down and be found no more at all. So it would be introducing a lot of confusion to call Jerusalem these uh, these uh, nicknames that are not flattering at all, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, and calling it that great city. And then this whole book is about the judgment of some great city. To introduce that confusion is not likely that um, he's he's calling Jerusalem the great city, but Babylon is a distinct city that's also called the great city. And uh, let me just pause here for just a moment to say the book of Revelation is about two cities. It's about Old Jerusalem and New Jerusalem. It's about Old First Covenant Jerusalem, Old Covenant Jerusalem that wouldn't get on board with the New Covenant that rejected the Lord Jesus and His apostles. And it's about the replacement of earthly Jerusalem with New Jerusalem. Earthly Jerusalem had a tabernacle that had the outer court it, or it had a temple, but the temple had outer court and inner court. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he ripped those in two. Uh, he ripped the veil in twain, and uh, that was uh, symbolizing that he was the great high priest that had entered into the heavenly uh, temple, uh, into the very presence of God with his blood for our, on our behalf. Uh, and when the first covenant temple, which had the outer court part of it still, was fully destroyed by the Romans, then came New Jerusalem to replace it, uh, the true Jerusalem, and that is in the shape of a cube representing just the holy place. The book of Hebrews says, chapter, eight, uh, chapter 9, verse 8, and let's just jump, well, yeah, let's just jump over there real quick. We can always come back. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. Notice that he says here, um, with regards to the way that the old temple, that the uh, first, that the, the way the tabernacle was arranged. Let's see where he says that. All right. Now, even the first had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary, the first covenant, the first covenant had ordinances, where the tabernacle was prepared. In the first part were the lampstands, the table, the showbread, which is called the holy place. And after the second curtain was the tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies. So you got two, two parts. you got the holy place and the holy of holies. And then he's going to go on to say in verse 8 that this, the Holy Spirit was is indicating this, that the way into the holy place was not yet revealed while the first tabernacle was still standing. So as long as that outer court existed as part of the temple framework, it's showing that this is not the right way. The way right to God is not yet clear. So when God was going to do away with the uh, that whole pattern, then the way to God would be revealed. The way to the holiest of all would be revealed, would be manifest. So it was revealed through the apostles' preaching and everything. But you got two groups of people. You got the Jews saying, We're the people of God, the children of God. Rather, we are the children of God, and the right way to God is through these ordinances, these animal sacrifices, the Levitical priesthood, etc. But you got the Christians saying, We are the children of God, and the way to God is through Jesus Christ the Son of God, the Lamb of God. You get two groups of people, two different messages, both claiming to be the sons of God. And until that whole system is completely taken out of the way, then it's not going to be yet manifest, and that's the word here he uses, I guess this translation used revealed. But it's not going to be, I think the King James might say manifest, let's see. Yeah, the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. So as long as that system remained, uh, 
the world would be a little bit under confusion about who's the, who is the true sons of God, which is the right way to God. So anyway, let's jump back over there to where we were in the book of Revelation. And I think we're kind of coming to the close on that point. So, wait, so to conclude that point, the first point is Revelation 11 establishes uh, that Jerusalem is the great city. And if Babylon the Great is called the great city and Jerusalem is called the great city, then Babylon the Great is Jerusalem. Next point is, and we'll go over to chapter 18 for this. Verse 24, I'm sorry, verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, you saints, apostles, and prophets, for God has judged your judgment on her. And uh, the King James here has, God has avenged you on her. Now, for God to avenge the apostles means that somebody did something wrong to the apostles that God has to come back and avenge on their behalf. So it has to be a city, in order for God to avenge in this great way of actually destroying the city, that means they would have had to have actually killed apostles. So what city can kill apostles, as we said earlier at the intro, it has to be a city that's contemporary with the apostles. God can't avenge uh, the apostles, uh, can't avenge the apostles on America because America hasn't done anything to the apostles. Uh, so it has to be a city, like I said, in the first generation, uh, in the apostles' generation. And you think for a moment, what city does the Bible say uh, would be guilty of killing the apostles? Well, uh, first of all, we only have one apostle being mentioned as uh, where we know where they died, and that's the apostle James. When Herod uh, killed him with the sword, and Herod tried to kill Peter also. Well, that was in Jerusalem. Then uh, Stephen was not an apostle, but he was killed in Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul, they tried to kill him in Jerusalem. You may remember whenever he was giving his discourse, and as soon as he mentioned that God had sent him to the Gentiles, they all yelled out, It is not fit for this man to live. And the Romans had to go down and rescue him from the crowd because they were about to try to kill him right there on the spot in the city of Jerusalem. So it's the city that killed the Lord Jesus. It's the city that killed... The prophets, it's the city that was going to kill the apostles. Also in the secular historians, in the book of Josephus, which is a pretty reliable historian, he mentions that James was killed in Jerusalem. I believe there's another historian, uh, reputable historian, that co corroborates that. But he mentions that the other James was killed in Jerusalem as well, which the New Testament also calls the other James an apostle. So you have apostles being killed there. We don't know where Peter was killed, but we know that the Lord Jesus did say that somebody would kill him when he signified what kind of death he would glorify the Lord with. But it doesn't say what city he was killed. But we do know that Peter was headquartered out of Jerusalem. In what little we know out of the book of Acts, we know that he did travel around um, it, but uh, whenever he writes his letter to the saints uh, up in Asia area, in the Turkey area, he writes from Babylon. And I think that's a good indication that he's already familiar with the book of Revelation. He knows full well that Jerusalem is Babylon. So he signs his letter that way with that code language. Anyway, it's a city that from this verse here, that did something to the apostles such that they needed to be avenged of her. And Jerusalem is the best fit for a city that kills the apostles because we have New Testament records of apostles being killed in Jerusalem. We have secular historians recording that apostles were killed in Jerusalem. Also where it says when, uh, the church, when there was a great persecution in Jerusalem that the Christians were scattered everywhere except the apostles, so they stayed put there. So that was like their headquarters. 
So that's the most likely city for apostles to die in if they're using that as their headquarters. One more verse that we can look at just real quick to kind of fit this in, and we may have to come back to this verse again later. But we have Matthew chapter 23, when the Lord Jesus is concluding his discourse with the and rebuke to the Pharisees here. He says, let's see, picking up in verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, wise men, and scribes. So this verse has three categories listed. Prophets, wise men, and scribes. He says some of them you're going to kill, etc. But when I look at the cross-reference, I believe it's to, uh, it might be in, in cross-reference to Mark. Let me just look at my commentaries real quick and see what they suggest. Maybe it's, that's not it. Okay, it's Luke 11.49. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will slay and persecute. Let me just go there. That the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. So in the parallel passage, uh, where here he's kind of giving the same rebuke to these people in Jerusalem here, the Pharisees. He this this uh, Luke's account records that he mentions apostles. So he says. So the Lord Jesus says that he's going to send. This is the wisdom of God said that he would send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they would kill, and persecute. And uh, so that that's a that's a. Real good case could be built or is being built for Jerusalem is Babylon the Great because Babylon the Great did something to the apostles that needed to be avenged even to the point of uh, taking the life of these of the inhabitants of Babylon the Great. And we have the New Testament showing that it was Jerusalem that was going to kill apostles and also was going to be the city that would be prophesied that they would kill apostles. And then we have the secular historians corroborating that. Now, for our third point, we're going to, we're, let's go back to Revelation chapter 18. We're going to go down to the last verse of the chapter, chapter 20, or verse 24. And it says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and all that were slain upon the earth. And this is very similar to our last point, but do you see, this is the, the point here is that he's kind of, I, like I said, I don't know if he's speaking hyperbola or some sort of form of speech where he's, maybe it's a little bit, exact, it could be a little bit exaggerated perhaps, but he's putting all the bloodshed and holding one city responsible for it. Uh, for in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. I think he's speaking in hyperbole, but maybe there's another form of speaking here. But he's laying it on this city Babylon the Great. And that looks just like our statement that we just, the statements that we just read when he was uh, standing in Jerusalem speaking to the leaders there in, ver in chapter 23 of Matthew. He says, uh, where, let's start in verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Again, we talked about that, about the, the persecution was from Jerusalem and going outward from there. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things will come upon this generation. And you might say, well, he's just talking about that generation. He didn't mention anything about a city. Revelation 18.24, he mentions a city. For in her was found the blood, etc. But look at the very next verse, verse 37. He just mentioned... All these things shall come upon this generation. What's the very next verse say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
you who kill the prophets and stone those which are sent to you, and stone them which are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. There's one last uh, point on this, one last uh, verse that could be brought to bear on this to kind of sum it up. And let's again look over at our commentator, see what cross-reference they give. And I'm looking for that verse that you uh, may be thinking of too, where he says, For it is impossible for a prophet to die outside of you. Hold on just a minute. I don't see it here. Let me do something real quick. It'll be here somewhere. <clears throat> okay. I think it's Luke 19.42. Let's read this. Saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee. Nope, that's not it. Sorry. Oh, here it is. Luke 13, 33. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Some of your translations read, it wouldn't do, it just wouldn't do for a prophet to die outside of Jerusalem. And then you have the uh, very parallel statement to the one we just read there in Matthew. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone those that are sent to you. How often I would have gathered your children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left you, unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Which, um, I guess since this is what we're all putting all this together, the Lord associates the destruction of Jerusalem with his coming. Do you see that? He's mentioning in verse 34, Jerusalem being destroyed. And in verse 35, he's mentioning his return. And that's the same thing we see over there in the book of Revelation. Chapter 18, he's talking about the destruction of the city. Very next chapter, chapter 19, is the Lord's return. He's coming on the white horse. Um, anyway, so just to seal up that, that uh, third point is that Jerusalem will be responsible for all the blood, the righteous blood shed on the earth. The Lord Jesus says about Jerusalem that it would be guilty of the blood of from, uh, that all the blood from Abel to Zechariah would be required of that generation and of that city. And over in Revelation chapter 18, verse 24, it says, For in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all uh, the righteous blood shed on the earth. And the Lord Jesus also said of Jerusalem that it was impossible that a prophet perish outside of her. So that's again sealing it up that it has to be Jerusalem. And that concludes our third point. And then lastly, if we want to just take a look at the broader context and see if Babylon the Great is first covenant, first century Jerusalem, how does that fit and square with the rest of the overall context of the book of Revelation? And so let's just jump over to Revelation real quick. If Babylon the Great is First Covenant Jerusalem, then that means the book of Revelation has to be about the first century. That means that the Lord's coming has to be in the first century. And what we'll see in the book of Revelation is that the Lord predicts, and the apostle here predicts, that the Lord is coming soon, even in his generation. So, in chapter 1, verse 1, it reads, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And in verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. In verse 7, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. So we're talking about that the people who pierced him would still be alive to be able to see his return. And all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. And then we have uh, in chapter 3, probably, the Lord Jesus warns the churches that he's coming. Behold, I come as a thief. Now, if he's talking to, let's see, this is Sardis. He's saying, wake up. 
you have a name that I think this is where you have a name that you live and you're dead. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So the Lord's talking about coming back very soon, even in the time of this church here in Sardis. And uh, we also have a couple other, let's, let's just, uh, I don't remember all these references, so let's jump over to my commentator real quick and see if this treasury of scripture knowledge is real valuable. Uh, I don't see it. Somewhere right in the middle of Revelation, you may be familiar with the verse, whoops, where he warns that he's coming quickly. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. But then when we get over to, ver we get over to chapter 22, it comes up a couple more times. I think that one might be like in chapter 14 that I was referencing. But here we have in chapter 22, verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps, his, keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. And then again, he's going to say some similar words. Verse 12, And behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according to his work shall be. And probably one more time. Let's see. Okay, and then in verse 20, Surely I come quickly. And you might be able to just think back that this is the kind of language that's all over the New Testament. The Lord Jesus says, This generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. He says, You shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. He says, some of the, There be some standing here that shall not taste death till the Son of Man be come. The book of Hebrews says, A little while and he shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Um, it's, it's just all over the New Testament that they were, they were looking for Him. They were expecting Him to come. So let's leave those time statements for a moment and uh, continue to work through this first century context. In the book of Revelation chapter 17 where it's describing the whore and it describes the beast on which she rides, which is indeed Rome. And that's, I think, why a lot of people get thrown off to think that the woman is Rome. Well, the woman is Jerusalem and she is riding Rome and that is that she is has made an alliance with Rome such to achieve her, um, her desire and her will, which is in many cases opposed to the will of God. Uh, and this is like a prostitution, a spiritual prostitution, just as we see coming up time and time again in the Old Testament, uh, Israel making alliances with other kingdoms contrary to the will of God. We see this kind of thing borne out in, ca in the case, for instance, with the cross and with Christ, where they said, we have no king but Caesar, showing that we're all right with allying with, al allying with and receiving benefits from, from Rome uh, if it helps us achieve our goals. Um, anyway, so the beast is Rome indeed. The woman is Jerusalem, First Covenant Jerusalem, which... Uh, utilizes that relationship that they have with Rome, that alliance. And, but eventually Rome gets fed up with Jerusalem and that's why we have this, they hate the, the ten horns of the beast, hate the woman and they burn her with fire. That, that may be generals, that may even be generals in the land of Israel who have uh, kind of traitorized over to the Romans when they come through and give them, give the Romans their allegiance, or it may be talking about just client kingdoms from roundabout nations. I'm not sure exactly who the horns are, those uh, ten horns. But uh, it talks about there are uh, seven kings, so these seven heads of the beast, those are Caesars, and it mentions, let's, uh, let me find it real quick, where it mentions, okay, here's the ten horns, which are kings, and I'm saying this might also just be uh, generals, which would be like kings. Or they might be client kings from these various nations right around the region. But let's see where it mentions. That might be chapter 16. Nope. It's got to be chapter 17. Okay. All right, here we are in verse 10. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. So we're talking about kings that are already 
have come and fallen by the time that John is writing this. And we're talking about a king that's in existence right at the time that John's writing this. And we're talking about this uh, this coming king that has got to continue just for a short space. And then we talk about the eighth king that's of the seven and goes into destruction. So these are, I would suggest these are Caesars at their first century. So just, again, thinking through the context. This is all first century context. Um, yeah, I could uh, continue to go on for more context clues. I did want to show you one other thing that's kind of not really real related to the topic, but it is an interesting thing. Also, I guess, with relation to the idea that how can Revelation really be first century. Uh, one thing that... Uh, maybe this is not so related. So I think I'll, I'll think I'll end it right there and make my next video. The what topic I was going to bring up was the new heavens and new earth, which I'm going to suggest we're in right now. But we'll save that for another video and show how that the new heavens and new earth were the very next thing on the horizon, uh, and that w that was to be uh, considered one and the same as the Lord Jesus' return. The Lord Jesus' return would bring in the new heavens and new earth, would, in which and those are the heavens and earth uh, which we are in right now, the new covenant heavens and earth. Anyway, so to, just to quickly summarize, we looked at four reasons why Babylon the Great has to be Jerusalem. It has to be Jerusalem because in chapter 11, Jerusalem is called the great city, just like Babylon the Great is. In chapter 18, verse 20, Jerusalem is guilty of doing something bad to the apostles. So it has to be a first century city. And Jerusalem uh, is, uh, we have records from the New Testament of Jerusalem killing apostles, and we have records from uh, secular historians of her killing the apostles. Then we have uh, chapter 18, verse 24, third point, which is that Jerusalem, that Babylon the Great is responsible for all the blood, and Jesus, the Lord Jesus holds Jerusalem responsible for all the blood. So we're talking about the same city. And then fourthly is just that the overall broader context of Revelation is first century events. And so it's got to be a first century city. And looking at how this woman rides the beast and such forth fits best for it being Jerusalem. Anyway, that concludes the video. I uh, hope you found, found that helpful. Thanks a lot. God bless.